Welcome to the Science of Beers podcast with me, Mick McGee. I love having proper conversations with intelligent people, especially over a beer, and that's exactly what this podcast is. We'll cover a new topic each week, so join us with a beer and let's cheers to science. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Science and Beers podcast. Thank you very much for the nice comments you gave to last week's podcast where I talked to Vincent Keating about Russian propaganda and how it challenges liberal democracy as an ideology in the West. This week, it's on to something completely different. And we're going to be talking with Associate Professor Aina Fisker from the University of Southern Denmark. Aina works uh, largely in West Africa, in Guinea-Bissau, and she she looks at programs and collect, collects big data to answer questions relating to vaccination. Hope you enjoy. Hi, Aina. Hey. Yes. Well, th- thanks very much for, for joining me. You have your beer in your hand. I have my beer here. Um, I also have a glass of water. Um, <laughs> and then I think, um, yeah. I- I'm going to crack one open right now. Then I will do the same. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> But but what you're saying is that it's it's a complicated story and it is a very complicated story, and uh, th- there are I- effects of vaccines that uh, that we're still trying to figure out causes for. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There's there's plenty we don't know, and uh, and we're closing. So so because the whole debate is so polarized, it's either black or white. We are also we stop listening. Uh, so, so the if, if if you are doubting, if if you are questioning the benefit of vaccines, then you are immediately put uh, in with a with an anti-vaxxer. Uh, and I am certainly questioning anything about vaccines, uh, and I want real data uh, to to investigate to to assess the real life impact of vaccines because I think our understanding. Our understanding of vaccines from the past has been insufficient. Um, so, but but I don't think that makes me an anti-vaxxer. And I would like to get some of the nuances out, but of course also to make sure that it's uh, it's used the right way. Yeah, well, I, I think that the militant approach that anti mm-hmm. anti-vaxxers take only encourages the the, the anti-vaxxers. Yeah, you know, but it's it, it's a complicated story in there and. Only science has the answer. Yes. Yep. Only science has the answer. That sounds good. <laughs> if we can start at the beginning, Aina, mm-hmm. could you tell us what is a vaccine? So the, the way we think of a vaccine is as a... Um, a biological substance, it could be, for example, a killed virus or bacteria or part of that, which you provide, well, pro- provide to uh, the immune system or you present to the, through the, to the immune system through an injection. It could also be the live, real bacteria, but in a weakened form. Um, so, so the idea is that when the immune system has met, the vaccine for the first time on a subsequent encounter with the with the real pathogen, so the real uh, disease-causing organism, then your immune system builds on the memory from, from a prior exposure and you can mount a much quicker immune response and not become ill mm. uh, from, from, from the real exposure. So that's that's the principle behind behind the vaccines. Yeah. Well I, I, uh, I had a little a little uh... I refreshed my memory earlier on today to just go back to the origins of vaccines or in inoculation. Mm-hmm. 
And I was I was yeah. reading about the the very colourful way in which people were inoculated against smallpox first, like five hundred years yeah. ago, by Buddhist monks in China. They uh, they got the scabs of the smallpox victims, and uh, apparently yeah. crushed it up into a powder and blew it up the nostrils of, of healthy people to okay. in, in, inoculate them against smallpox. Yeah. And then you had later on in, in the 18th century uh, a similar theme, but, yeah. but putting uh, scabs from smallpox victims on, on cuts from healthy individuals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I, th- I think that, that, that's, first of all, disgusting. Uh, but, 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 <laughs> but, but second of all, I, I think that was a nice picture to, to really see how, how, how the vaccines work. You know, you take, you take the, the nasty stuff and, uh, and, and the nasty stuff in a weakened in a weakened form. form. Uh, that that's how we normally think uh, that a vaccine works, and it certainly is also how it works. But it's not the whole story of how the vaccine works, and and that's where the field of research that I'm working in then comes uh, comes in and tries to change change the picture. Um, okay, C- can I ask, uh, Anna, how did you get into this this field? How did you get into this this field of science? Well, um, what's your motiv- motivation? Well, well, I, I guess it's it's all um, coincidences. Um, so I had I had a school friend uh, who I was uh, traveling with uh, during a Christmas break during high school years, who was from from Ghana, and 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 it was like uh, drum music from Ghana really fascinated me. So. Um, so during medical school, I was looking at uh, possibilities of, of traveling, traveling to Ghana to do an elective. Um, and then out of the blue comes a um, um, uh, job posting or a research, a scholarship posting for uh, looking for a research year student uh, in Guinea-Bissau. And uh, well, that's also West Africa. And I didn't know anything about the country. Uh, at that point of time, um, but I thought the opportunity of being able to combine a little bit of, uh, yeah, travel fever with um, with with research sounded great. And then I went to Guinea-Bissau as a research year student uh, and worked for a year on a study of vitamin A and vaccines. Um, and then I came back to Denmark and um, to continue uh, medical school. And I thought, I'm not completely done with this. Um, I still had uh, some data collection going on, and I wanted to come back uh, to Guinea-Bissau as well. Uh, so I to hear the drums. To hear the drums, <laughs> but but I found out that there was much more to Guinea-Bissau than the drums. Um, nice. And and then. Um, so I spent another half a year uh, working on on the data, learning learning some more methodology, also uh, courses in statistics and 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 other things. And then I still wasn't completely done. And then I started uh, preparation for a PhD uh, in Guinea-Bissau. And when I finished medical school, I then traveled back to Bissau. Um, to do my PhD, and then I sort of never left. Um, so, so I've been working um, with this health and demographic surveillance system uh, in Guinea-Bissau for, yeah, for uh, yeah, all throughout um, my my working life. Uh, it's a sec- second home. It, it's uh, yeah, and, and and I think it's only now during Corona where I haven't been able to go to Bissau that it actually starts feeling like Denmark is my first home because uh, I certainly have spent more time in Bissau for the past yeah eight nine years um, than I have in Denmark. Is is it doing okay with regards uh, Corona? Uh, it's difficult to say again because. The, the number the number of cases you have depend on who who is being tested um, and and as long as it's um, as long as it's contact tracing and mainly asymptomatic people being tested then uh, there certainly are increases in numbers but mortality remains uh, fortunately very low 
but but whether that really reflects that we have a low corona mortality in Guinea-Bissau is still unknown. And I think, at least from, from what I hear from, from colleagues in Bissau, is that fear of seeking uh, health care is also uh, certainly having impact on the number of patients they have uh, in the hospital and in the health facilities. Uh, why why would moment. that fear be there? Because people are afraid of contracting Corona, uh, and and when treatment centers are uh, within the hospital, then 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 yeah. then that's well, that's what people are. That makes sense. Saying. That makes sense. I, I do not want to end up in a, in a hospital here in Denmark, um, particularly at the moment. Your your work. It, it shows that um, a vaccine for say, the BCG vaccine or else the measles vaccine, it has non-specific benefits. Exactly. So non-specific beneficial effects. So so side effects, which, which you can't explain uh, based on the response towards, so measles, uh, the measles vaccine towards the effect against the measles infection. Uh, the measles virus uh, or the diseases which would maybe follow down the line after a measles infection. But somehow later and uh, also if there's no measles around, you can see that children are less likely to die uh, if they have received the measles vaccine. And when I talk about mortality, then then that's data from, from the African settings. But... Um, but 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 not limited to their uh, collaborators. Uh, also, in other low-income settings in in Asia, have shown similar benefits of of measles vaccine. So so, so if I understand this correctly, uh, for example, you, you work in Guinea Bissau, Bissau. Uh, you, yes. You you collect uh, data like big data. So with with uh, children who have had uh, the, a measles vaccine and pe- children who have not. And then you look at the mortality difference between between uh, these samples, and other, also whether the mortality was caused by measles or a different disease. And then you're you're, you're yeah. seeing that the, if you have the vaccine against measles, it somehow protects against other th- diseases. Yeah. So so that's that's how the whole story uh, started out with collecting. So so forty. 43 years ago in Guinea-Bissau, measles was a very common uh, infection still uh, in Bissau. It's it's no longer a common infection there today. But back um, around 30 years ago, the researchers then observed working in Bissau that children who had received the measles vaccine had uh, lower mortality from all sorts of other infections and, and mainly observing effects for for airway infections or so respiratory infections, pneumonias, uh, but but also outside, uh, so so outside, um, so also during periods where there was no no measles around. Um, similarly, for BCG, so BCG is a, a vaccine which is given to protect against tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is not a major killer for young children, as far as we know. But in spite of that, having received a, a BCG, a tuberculosis vaccine, is associated with a much lower mortality in, in very young children. So, so we are standing there with effects which are more marked than can ex- be explained by the proportion of mortality normally caused by these infections. Yeah. And, and and these, as long as they're observational data, so as you described, first you go out, you collect the data, you observed, have they been vaccinated or have they not been vaccinated? You could argue that all sorts of other explanations could, there could be all sorts of other explanations as to why these children had lower mortality. Um, but, but that's why we've not only been looking at... Um, at the observational data, uh, we've been doing also intervention studies uh, in Guinea-Bissau, so trying to test expected improvements uh, to the vaccination program and finding support for 
measles vaccine having beneficial effects on on child mortality, which we can't explain by preventing measles infection. And similarly, that BCG vaccine protects against early neonatal mortality. That's that's one of the questions that you're working to address, is it? Like, why why, why do these uh, non-specific benefits arise? Um, it, it is one of the questions that our research group is working to address. Yeah. Uh, but 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 within so speaking of the Bandim Health Project, which is uh, the the research station in Guinea Bissau, where a larger group of researchers are working. What what I'm uh, specifically working on uh, together with a group within the Bandim project is looking at how do what does it then take to get these uh, these patterns that we have observed to actually get that into the way the vaccination program is implemented. Um, so so in that sense, my research branches off from from the mechanistic part. We're not examining why does this happen and how does it happen we are more focusing on saying okay this happens how should we use the knowledge that it happens um so so in that sense my angle towards this is slightly different so, yeah. so you look you you find some uh, benefits to, to vaccines uh is the data also suggesting any negative effects yes I think I think there there are some nuances which are necessary to make sure that um, that that the message which which people also stay with is not one of uh, we. So so our problem is always around communicating that some vaccines may actually, in addition to providing the protection against the targeted uh, disease, leave people worse off in fighting um, in fighting other infections um, and and I'm afraid that 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 point um, that point is 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 um, well, um, well that, that must be very very tricky because as we discussed we're, we're aware that if, if there's just a little bit of fuel, just a little, a little bit, bit of a snippet to the anti-vaxxers. Uh, they're going to take, yeah. they're going to take that and run with it. Uh, but, but uh, you know, th- but, things but, aren't black and white in, in this world. There's, there's pros and cons to many things. Mm. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I'm interested to hear, hear what, what, what you say about the potential negative effects of, of those vaccines. Yeah, but I think, I think the main point regarding the potential negative effect is that you can actually counteract them by making sure that you uh, provide a live vaccine afterwards. Uh, so so it's not, you do, you provide the non-live vaccine to provide the protection against the targeted infection, and then any potential negative effect which it may have appears to disappear once you provide the subsequent live vaccine. But So, so the live, that, like the denatured live vaccine? Uh, so the attenuated live vaccine. Mm-hmm. So so you can either kill it or you can weaken it. And and what we are seeing here is that with the live vaccines, which would be the measles vaccine or the BCG vaccine against tuberculosis, if they are provided after uh, one of the uh, killed vaccines, the inactivated vaccines, that's where you uh, then then this negative effect. Which may have been there is is no longer visible. So so that if there is a negative um, if if there is a negative effect of the non live vaccine, then we can stop that effect by providing a live vaccine afterwards. And what kind of negative effects are you talking about with the the non live vaccine? So so the data I'm looking at is the data uh, from Guinea-Bissau and and the negative effects we're measuring there is the uh, is mortality. So Okay, that's, that's okay. The, so, so that's, that's pretty that's serious a, negative that's effect. A, sorry? That's a pretty ser- serious negative effect. That 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 is is a serious negative effect and it's not like so it's not like we can cautiously 
pin it down and saying it happened because of this vaccine. So what we're looking at are population level associations there. Um, but the associations are there. It, it sounds to me that you're you're on the verge of a you know a, a, a beautiful story in science here. You know, so just like Edward Jenner noticed the, mm. the maids that hang around it with with cows and get cowpox, they don't get human smallpox. And so the yeah. data was speaking. So so you're looking into the data here, and you're saying that the way uh, vaccines are administered to boys and girls in, in Guinea-Bissau, you, they get a dead virus as a vaccine, and then sometimes later on they get a, a live vaccine. And, and you're saying for some reason, if they just get the dead vaccine, there's some mortality there, particularly in the boys. But if they get the dead vaccine... Particularly in the girls. Oh, sorry, particularly in the girls. Yeah. Uh, but if they get the, the dead vaccine and then followed by some time after the live vaccine, there, it, it, it's a it's a it's a positive it, it, it has a negative effect on mortality yes and so so that's your story there that's the story that the data says but it'll take a a lot more work to to try to find the exact explanation for for why this yes. is because what, what if the data speaks in those big numbers it's uh you can't really argue with that there's something going on there there's some kind of explanation and it's either biochemical or or, or there's there's something extra something something else at play yeah and 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 meanwhile we need to make sure that the way we evaluate the program actually takes this sequence into account because because what we are what's what's being pushed in the in the agenda uh, so so what we measure is what we're also likely to see. Um, so if I say, okay, vaccination coverage by 12 months of age is the indicator that you're being measured on, your choice of um, your choice along. So what what is what is the choice when you have these four children? Should they be vaccinated now, or should you save the doses? So if you're being evaluated on number of doses wasted. Uh, and coverage by 12 months, and you might say they can come back next week where I'll vaccinate them. If you're evaluated on the number of children following the correct sequence, then it'll be a priority to get them vaccinated. Mm. Uh, so so I, think, I think the way vaccination programs are evaluated today does not reflect necessarily the way in which the program should be implemented to obtain the maximum benefit on child mortality. And that's that's where I think we can do something already today. Okay, that, that's that's uh, an interesting story there. That, that the, 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 the design of how the data is collected also may, may have an influence on, on, on the outcome. The, the, the design of how we evaluate the program, I think does have an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on how the program is being implemented and thereby has an impact on on the effect of the of the program yeah. as a whole. And and, and uh, you, you already commented on, on the, the challenges there, but do you think it's it's possible in the Guinea Bissau example to to implement your recommendations on the front line to the to the doctors that are that are administering the the vaccines? That's what we're trying to do now. Yeah. Um, so, so in collaboration with World Bank, uh, which is uh, funding a performance-based uh, financing um, or planning to fund, uh, planning to implement performance-based financing in Guinea-Bissau um, very soon. Uh, that's that's where where we've then been discussing, okay, how should we actually formulate these vaccination program indicators in order to optimize the impact on health? Mm -hmm. uh, so so that's what we are putting to a test now. Yeah. Can we can we actually affect the way the program is being implemented by evaluating or by changing the way in which it's evaluated? Yeah. Well I'm looking forward to hearing the results. Uh, just, just so long, just so we're not just talking about uh, Guinea-Bissau. Do you have any? Do you have any data to to back up the same theories uh, elsewhere here in Denmark, for example? Is is there non-specific effects of 
the measles vaccine or the BCG here in Denmark? Yeah, uh, so we have, um, I have colleagues working with data, data from, from Denmark, so using vaccination data from the national registers and evaluating not mortality in Denmark, but admission, uh, admission to hospital. And BCG vaccine is not provided as part of the routine uh, vaccination program in Denmark, but for measles vaccine, they are observing that um, that if you have have received your measles vaccine, you have a lower risk of being uh, admitted to hospital for infectious diseases. In line with the findings of Guinea-Bissau, they also observe that it's particularly pronounced for uh, for respiratory infections. Uh, and if you provide a non-live vaccine after the measles vaccine, so if the schedule is shifted around, they also see higher risk of hospital admissions. So, so as so far, the, the pattern observed uh, for infectious diseases in Denmark uh, are similar. Okay, and, and is, is it part of the, the, uh, the, the protocol to, to administer in the right order here in Denmark? Yes, the, the, it's, it's so in Denmark, parents used to have to call uh, their general practitioner and schedule uh, an appointment. Um, that is slightly being changed now with now they're receiving reminders uh, about the vaccines uh, so that I would imagine that in the future, the variation, the natural variation in the implementation of the program would be less. Uh, but it certainly is policy to administer them in the correct order. Um, but, but, but delays also occur uh, in a Danish setting. You mentioned there, uh, you're looking at the vaccines and vitamin A. I didn't quite get that link. No. Um, so, so the vaccine is like the great success of, of, uh, public health interventions in uh, low and middle income countries. It's an intervention, you get it delivered, and it actually has a relatively high coverage. So we are looking at something like uh, 80 some percent coverage uh, of the, the indicator vaccine. So, so it's a program which reaches the vast majority of children. Since, since it's a uh, a, a program which works in that sense, it's also been used as a system to piggyback other interventions on. And one of these interventions has been vitamin A supplements. So vitamin A is fat soluble vitamin and it's uh, stored in the body. But if you have a, a, a um, nutrient intake which is insufficient of vitamin A, then your level will eventually so you are able to store some in your body, but but of course, if you don't get enough through nutrition, then your level will fall. When you have severe vitamin A deficiency, immune the immune system is affected and you have higher mortality. Uh, so child mortality has been used as an indicator of vitamin A deficiency mm. uh, rather than rather than so so sort of switching uh, cause and effect around here. Anyway, it's recommended then to use the contacts with the health system to provide uh, high dose vitamin A supplements every four to six months. Children are supposed to receive high dose vitamin A, so many times larger than the daily requirement, which is not a problem because you can store the vitamins. As long as it's not given to anyone who's pregnant, that's not perceived as a problem. Then when you start providing vitamins alongside the vaccines, then you may be pushing this balance uh, between the immune response to the vaccine uh, and then also providing a compound which works as an immune stimulator. So, so that, that's, that's my way into this. That's something I, I had never, never even thought about, you know. So, so the vaccine, it's, it, it's, it's meant to provoke a reaction from the immune system, but if the immune system mm. isn't healthy, 
you know that, then you may respond less less strongly to the vitamin E at least that was that's that's the starting point of this uh, yeah. this area so vitamin A was commonly given alongside measles vaccine it was it, studies are made when when this started to be recommended back in the 90s or probably so the recommendation to provide vitamin A alongside uh alongside vaccines after six months of age. So that's a recommendation from 94. Um, the studies... Is that, is that, sorry, is that, is that recommendation in, in every country? Or? It's, it's a recommendation in countries where there's a, where vitamin A deficiency was a public health problem. Okay. And the way you defined a public health problem of vitamin A deficiency, one of the indicators was the level of mortality. So if there was high mortality... That was defined as in the absence of having biochemical data of vitamin A deficiency, you would assume that there was a problem. So, so vitamin A supplements alongside vaccines was a recommendation. The, the way it had been evaluated, what's the consequence of this, was by looking at antibody response to the vaccine. So if the take of the vaccine was not lessened by providing vitamin A alongside it, then it was assumed that everything was good. But again, looking only at the specific vaccine response and not on on the wider consequences uh, on on child health, on other indicators of child health, such as mortality. So, so what I was doing for my PhD work uh, in Guinea-Bissau was a randomized trial. So in Guinea-Bissau, it was so it had been a recommendation to give vitamin A supplements alongside uh, vaccine, vaccines after six months of age. That had been a recommendation since 94. It was not yet in, implemented in Guinea-Bissau. So what we did was a randomized to, trial to test if that would actually be beneficial uh, to implement it. Um, and, and we found no overall effect on child mortality. But we did find strong sex differential effects. So boys did um, boys receiving vitamin A alongside their vaccines had higher mortality, almost two times higher mortality, while mortality in girls was halved. Okay. So so a recommendation at that point of time it had been a recommendation for 20 years and it had never been um, and it had never been tested when we came out with with these results. Uh, so, so I think I think from that that angle, the wow. the vitamin A story is a very good example of how can we have programs which are made for they are formulated based on us examining them for the measure which we think is relevant which is not overall mortality or another outcome reflecting overall health status. They examined in this case for their impact on the vaccine response. And based on that, it's concluded that it's safe to give. Um, but that's not what our data indicated. It, it indicated no overall effect, but actually negative effects for boys. Wow. Do, 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 do you have any explanation about why the vitamin A supplements had a negative effect? We, yeah, um, the so so we were providing vitamin A alongside vaccines after six months of age. So so here, the effect now numbers become small when we start subdividing it by different uh, vaccine groups. But we could see that those who had the particular negative effects are the children receiving. Uh, are the boys receiving a combination of live and inactivated vaccine along, uh, alongside vitamin A supplements? Um, so, 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 I don't have a biological explanation or a mechanistic explanation uh, of of what is going on, um, but but it does fit with the patterns we've seen otherwise by co-delivering live and inactivated vaccines together, that this does not seem to be a good cocktail for boys. Okay. Getting me back to, okay, then it is important to respect the schedule and rather than give measles and PTP together, we need to 
give DTP and then provide the measles vaccine afterwards because because that's the sequence which is associated with the lower mortality. Well, it, it, it sounds like you know you're not you're not trying to sh give everything to the body at once. You're trying to spread it out, which which makes inherent sense to me. Yeah, one, and, one and, at a time. And I think, and, and that's also what the what the schedule stipulates. So the vaccination schedule um, recommended for infants, but it's not how it's implemented um, because there are delays and, well, there are delays in seeking vaccination. There are delays caused by vaccines not being available when you come for vaccination. And then there are actually also delays because some of these vaccines are delivered in multi-dose vials. So if you have four children to vaccinate, against measles, they may be told, sorry, I have a vial here which contains 10 doses. This is a live vaccine. That means six hours after mixing the freeze-dried virus with its diluent, I need to discard it. If I'm going to vaccinate these four children today, then I waste six doses of vaccine. And that is uh, commonly not practiced uh, in the field. It's not a recommendation, it's, it's the WHO recommendation or the UNICEF recommendation says vaccinate at any opportunity. But, but the problem is that in a, in a low resource health setting, that is, that is not uh, how it's practiced. So, so, so the health worker will sit there and they will make their calculations and say, okay, if I throw out six vaccines, I may run out of vaccines, so I can't vaccinate these four children. Um, it's it's a long way from the the office of the people who recommend to the to the front line. Absolutely, yeah. there is a long way from 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 the from the air conditioned program offices <laughs> to to the field yeah. in in yeah. Guinea Bissau, and and I and I think it's commonly when when presenting this, it's we met with a oh, but that's just Guinea Bissau, and I don't think it is. Uh, I think it is much more widely practiced that way. But the problem is that the way we evaluate the program doesn't reflect how it's implemented. So if, if what the program is evaluated on is a number of doses delivered to children below 12, years of age, uh, 12 months of age, then, then delays are not captured uh, in yeah, in, in, in the data to be reported to these air-conditioned offices. Uh, and, and, and therefore, you get a feedback. It looks okay. We have a high vaccination coverage. Yeah, that might be true, but, but it did not cover that the median delay in BCD vaccine, which is supposed to be given at birth, was uh, one month, uh, and that or even, even bigger in Bissau, we have like 40 percent of children in the rural area are vaccinated by one month and even though many of them would be born in health facilities or would have been taken to the health facility uh, on several several locations so so i think the the focus on getting the real life data um collected is both a focus on how is the program being implemented but also very much on so what does this what does this affect or what does this implementation actually mean to child health? Well, it, it's a the the answers are in the numbers. The answers are in the numbers, and it, it takes people such as yourself to 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 get those numbers. So yeah, but but it also takes that that we are present. Uh, yeah, I, I mean you have you have to. You have to be in the field uh, to experience that this is how it's done. So, so I think I think that's I I, I think that is that is um, an important part of the work that that we are doing. Uh, it is investigating. So, what happens in the field? What sort of data do we need to ensure? is collected to be able to document the real life implementation and then getting that information back to policymakers.
Yeah, the, the more we can do to, to 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 not go out there and say, "Hey, vaccines are great," you know, just say vaccines improve life expectancy, particularly among among kids. Yeah, is that not a good thing? <laughs> that is that is certainly a good thing. I think we and and we can say that. I think that's that statement we can go out and say fairly strongly that vaccines protect against infections. They do increase uh, survival. Uh, and and what I would then add was and to make sure that they increase they do improve survival as much as possible. We need to make sure that we use them in the wisest possible way. Yes, and and it's uh, it's uh, collect, the collection of big data. Uh, yeah, is is, is going to help there. I hope so. <laughs> Ada, thanks very much for joining me for the Science and Beers podcast. It's been a, a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, Skull. <laughs> Skull. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. If you want to uh, keep up to date with the work of, of Dr. Fisker, her Twitter tag is at Aine Fisker. A-N-E-F-I-S-K-E-R. Um, and please consider becoming a patron of this podcast so we can continue. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash science and beers. Thanks for listening. My guest this week is Associate Professor Ada Fisker. She works at the University of Southern Denmark. Her work takes her often to West Africa, to Guinea-Bissau, where she looks at questions relating to vaccination. Hope you enjoy.